midnight tonight, right? There we are. How many could make it to midnight? <laughs> really? You could? Without heavy coffee or drugs, right? No? Straight up? Midnight? Wow. How many can make it to midnight, huh? Not me. Really? You guys are young, exciting. That's why I hang around you, then. <laughs> young and exciting. I'm old, but getting closer to be young forever. Which means I might be younger than you. Look at that. A couple of announcements. Um, Harmony of the Gospels. This is for David. Uh, class will begin on Sunday, January 14th at 9 a.m. This class is about the life of Jesus of all four of the Gospels. The class meets on the blank, blank room. I don't know the name of the room. <laughs> we don't know the name of the room. The room has no name. It's not the upper room, it's the back room. Right? There we go. That's why it's blank. Thank you. Everyone is welcome. Look at that. It's an inclusive guy. The class begins Sunday the 14th. How long is class going for so we know? Mid-May. Mid-May. Okay, that's a long time. So, in the same time, we don't want to cut into that class. Uh, Pastor Steve and myself are going to co-teach a Sure Foundation class, which is going to be a little bit more broad for some of you that went through the assurance class. Because uh, I want to add eternal security to it, too. There's, there's verses that give you assurance. But I need to know that I'm safe forever, right? I mean, I'm in this thing for my life. And I want to know one of the great doctrines of scriptures is the doctrines of perseverance. My perseverance, how about that God perseveres with me is more important, right? That God doesn't give up on me. Most of us give up on ourselves before we get there. But God doesn't give up on me if I'm his son. And uh, I like that teaching. And I think that's essential if I'm going to grow through the seasons of life. Uh, we are in the book of Luke. We are in the great uh, biography, you know, uh, I don't know if you get this, the scriptures are all, Luke is the best teacher uh, in this program. Um, he is all about the idea of telling an accurate story. Isn't it good to have an accurate story? Most of us exaggerate stories, don't we? Like if I caught a fish, I would tell you, <laughs> and then my, somebody would say in my family, it was a snake in minnow. The, it was break your heart, don't okay? People that I witnessed stuff, good, bad, and ugly. But the truth is, we can exaggerate stories. Stories can get exaggerated when you tell them around the room. You know, the whole story changes. So he went to eyewitnesses. I like Luke because, you know, many times you wonder, like, well, where was the gospel of Thaddeus? You know, why didn't Thaddeus say anything? Or why? How about Mary, right? Uh, we definitely know he interviewed. Mary in this thing, because only she would know Mary, the things that she knew, right, about Jesus as a baby. Nobody else was there. She was there. So we definitely know she uh, she was interviewed. She probably didn't want to write a book, but Luke did. So I, I like to think that all the disciples were interviewed. So this is like, it's not just Matthew's gospel. Uh, it's not just John's gospel. It's not just Mark's gospel. Luke is like it's all these guys' gospel. In fact, maybe he interviewed everybody in the 120 people that were in the upper room. Hey, what do you think? What do you see? What do you do? And they added a little bits of stories about Jesus. And many times they coincide. But he, what he said is he did a thorough work here. True. Did a thorough work. And God does a thorough work. Whether you know it or not, he wants to do a thorough work in my life, in your life. And as we enter the year, I, I want you to be remembered that most likely Jesus was born on the Jewish New Year. And that's in September, by the way. Okay? Really good to know that and really good to think about that. It makes your New Year brighter. So today we celebrate a pagan New Year with a Roman calendar, but the Jewish calendar is linear. It changes all the time with our calendar. It goes by the moon doesn't change in its calendar. But it's great to know the feasts that come about there are the feasts of uh, the New Year. Then comes the feasts of the Day of Atonement in our language. And then comes the festival 
of booths. So called booths. All these are fulfilled actually in the millennial, by the way, if you read your Bible. They're fulfilled. There is a day of atonement. God will judge the Jewish people in the millennial. Uh, all the Jews that come in, God will have a day where they set up booths. Uh, yeah, it is like a new year. Maybe he comes back on his birthday. Wouldn't it be good to come back on your birthday? I mean, I like to do great things about the birthday, right? Mm -hmm. I know you say nobody cares. I don't care about my birthday, but if somebody forgets, you do care. <laughs> like my daughter today talking to her, didn't know how to spell my name. I'm like, how long have you been with me? <laughs> and then she defended me with her butchering of Isaac's name because you can spell it like five different ways. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we kind of get bent out when our birthday is forgotten. Or how about this lady's your wedding anniversary? Oh, the ultimate, like, wrath of God, wrath of life, right? But you forgot you were married to me. Huh? I will make you remember. The day that lives in infinity, right? Yeah, you know, we want to be remembered, and uh, God wants us to remember him. In fact, if you forget him, that's one of the great curses of the wrath of God, all the nations that forget God. And Psalm 9, 17, I think it is, and then people, the wicked, forget God, right? We need to remember God. No better story than the book of Luke to remember God, by the way. No greater story. It really is as you know God and you become more and more like God and the Holy Spirit. That's why, you know, we're, we're preaching Revelation and the Holy Spirit. Uh, I want you to get the point. I don't give points. We go through the outline. I want you to get the point from God. I don't want to tell you a point. I don't want to point my finger at you. I want God and the Holy Spirit to do what? Convict you. You can't repent without conviction, okay? And the only way you change is by repentance. True? And then you have the three R's. You know the three R's? How do you know the three R's? Reading, writing. I was in a problem with that. Because the rhythm begins with an R. And writing begins with an W. And writing begins with a W. Thank you. We have some brilliant people here that know, like, uh, wordology or etymology. So the word etymology. Yeah, words. How they're built and all that. Uh, yeah, but you know what? God has three R's. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna say four R's. Remember, right? You're gonna get you gave you a fourth R. See, see the value. Remember, right? Repentance, true. Reconciliation, and how about restoration? You think they're more important? Yeah, I'd rather be really, really dumb at math to know that that God has a plan to do that. Conviction's about remembering, isn't it? It's a good point. Conviction, i got to be convicted. Uh, Kevin Bodies, many of you, Jerry Consolini gave me a theological word today. <laughs> and you, Barbara, thought it couldn't happen, and there it is. <laughs> See, awe. Oh, the 10 days of awe. Oh. Do you know, do you know the, going back, yeah, into the, the 10 days of awe. Anybody know the 10 days of God and all the hol holy holidays in September? They're called the 10 days of awe. 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 Like really awe. And really, it's great to think that they start at the birth of Christ. Uh, Jesus in, in the Son of Man, which is this book here by Daniel, uh, he lives like three days, doesn't he? I mean, three. he lives three years. He's on the gospel three days. And then the tribulation is what? The one week of Daniel, right? The last week, which will come. And that's the tribulation, the day of Jacob's trouble, it's called. But that's seven years. What's three and seven? Jesus' ministry as God, Jesus coming back. Three, this is for math. Now, I know I did I put down arithmetic. Seven and three equal ten, ten days of awe. Ten days of the story of the Messiah. Ten days of awe. It peaks in his three years in ministry. And it peaks during the tribulation when he comes back again. Comes the first time, comes the second time. That's why he might come back on his birthday. 
and then all the Feast of Atonement, the Day of Atonement for the Jews, comes to flourishing as a nation, and then also the Booths of Shachar are gone. That's scholarly. It's not all mine, it's other people too. But it makes way more sense than a Roman holiday for a pagan holiday made Jesus' birthday, doesn't it? Right? It's a better New Year. I would like New Year to start with Jesus. True? And I'd rather get to, uh, not make a resolution because how many ever keep their resolutions? And then how long is the shelf life of your resolution? Not long, right? But how many ever when they see God in the fullness of who he is, the God man? By the way, when we talk about communion, that happened, the merging of that happened only through one thing, blood. His blood. He merges the divine with the human. By his blood, he binds the two. Colossians chapter, I think it's two, Ephesians chapter one. He makes peace through the death of his cross, the blood of his cross, right? He binds us together with him through that. Love that. And I love, like, when I think of New Year's, I like to think of it as like, hey, you know what? This is a new beginning. Everybody needs a new beginning. But I don't need a new beginning that's going to be old tomorrow. I need a new beginning that's going to walk, as it said in Hebrews chapter 10, 20, that I'm going to walk in the newness of life. How about that kind of newness? How about a car that never gets old, right? Instead of, like, if you get a new car, it's old like an old for scratches there. Okay. Yeah. It gets old really, really quick in this universe of science that everything degrades in the second law of thermodynamics and my car falls apart. Sooner or later it will end in a rust bucket, right? True. My body falls apart. Right? I was once I look at my young dog so handsome at one time. My wife married me there. I got to claim the fame. See? We are in this book, and we are resolved to see Jesus as Son of Man. That's what we portray here as. And I really, like I said, I got that going through Dave, who we studied the book of Luke at the sign of trust. And I was more enraptured by the book of Luke than I was about the teaching points and this and that, which I probably should have been. But I was more enamored by knowing that Jesus was all man. And Luke does the best job. And right after this is Son of God. The two are both there. Son of God is hammered into the divine by John. But he also mentions Daniel being the Son of Man. You can't have one without the other. The priority is here for you to know he was a man. Because guess what? He is Jesus. You can identify with a person, and even that's hard today. But you can identify with a person who loved and died for you, but also lived a life full life, you can identify with him way easier than he can a spirit, right? That's why religion becomes so evil in the sense when it portrays Jesus in the dark ages, if you look at the dark ages where everything was an icon, icons were like, they're not dimensional, so they were painted, if you look at medieval art from the dark ages, Jesus is like, like not multi-sided, but just like an icon flat. And it's also depicts him usually as gigantic. Guess how it depicts you? We will gather around the throne, his hands, right? The giant Jesus. Kind of hard to relate to that, true? Kind of like he might step on me, true? But that was medieval art. That's why it's good reason it's called the Dark Ages. But the Renaissance came, don't forget the Reformation came too. And that was part of it, where men were more reading the Bible. And they began to see God and have knowledge of God to worship him. And they saw him in what? As a man. And therefore when you get Renaissance art, you see an equal equilibrium of the two that the people around Jesus, Jesus is a real person depicted. And you see people as real people. And then you can have a real what? Relationship. You won't get stepped on, right? By a physical Jesus. He can know you, and he lived a life that he could experience everything you go through. That's what Luke is portraying. Because you got to remember, at this time, 
there were all kinds of heresies. What were heresies? Heresies were depicting Jesus like floating as a baby. There's many stories. You want to read the archives of Apocrypha? There's many stories about Jesus' life from 30 or from 1 to 30, you know, and, and they're not in the Bible. This is the only part we're going to read now that depicts Jesus in 30 years of life. But there's a lot of stories about floating babies, and he wasn't real, and, you know, he did miracles, and he went to Arabia, and, you know, as a baby, he floated over there. Whatever it is, there's all kinds of stories that he was spirit, and he was supernatural. He went, he went to the American Indians, right? I don't know, as a baby, he could have. But there are all kinds of extra stories, many of them Gnostic, which were they either portrayed in dualism, his manhood, that he was man, he really wasn't God, or they portrayed the other, these are all satanic, they portrayed the other side that he was all spirit of God and never was a man. Because how could it be a man in Greek culture? The flesh was evil. So how could God become evil? How about this one? How could God die? That's crazy, right? God can't die. We wouldn't be here if God died. So you had all kinds of non-thinking Gnostic heresies that people fall into. They're still here today. But Christianity from the Nicene Creed, from the early church fathers who paid a price to write this down with their own bodies, by the way, tortured and persecuted, they put the Nicene Creed down that it was verily God, all God, and all men. Luke is given the task by the Holy Spirit to write down to eyewitnesses that he was all man. That's the priority here. That I know that I can relate to him, and I know he relates to me. Now, when we read this, you know, when you go to pragmatism and utilitarianism, like, you know, couldn't God just come down and live a three-day weekend here and then go to the, you know, it's all about the uh, cross, the burial, and the resurrection. Couldn't he just do that in three days, take a vacation from heaven, go back? What's the answer to that? No. How about just three years? Could he just appear at, at the baptism, get baptized, and live? How about that? Sounds good, right? God hates waste. But no, he had to live. Through childhood, right? To full maturity. 30 years in the Jewish thing is when you could become a rabbi. You were actually, it's the same way here. You know, you look at a young person wanting to be spiritual, and you're like, why don't you live a few more years and see what that's like? Why don't you get married and see how you need to live through that? <laughs> it's good you're the husband of one wife, and kind of like pastors to be married, because if you can live through marriage, you might live through anything. I don't need to be saying, my goodness, this is New Year's Eve. I'm supposed to have fun here. What's a laugh. Jerry's like, that's good. He's a sleepy theologian. Yeah, yeah you got to live a little bit to experience a little bit, to know a little bit, don't you? True. Good, bad, and ugly, the great movie, right? Ultimately, the blessed. Luke is going to portray that here for us, that we would know it, that he lived. You know, it's kind of like this. You know, if you're going to do the crime, you know, if you're going to do the crime, you got to do the time. Get that? Okay. That's how we relate theologically to you, and I'll, I'll, I'll develop that as we go. We are in the portion here in Luke chapter 2. Let you turn there. We're continuing. Now, honestly, I want you to get this as background in the sense of this. We are at verse 39 in chapter 2. This is very boring, okay? Most people read over it. There's one sentence here about Jesus in 30 years. That's a pretty boring life, right? How many of you live really exciting lives? How many of you ever thought of writing your own biography or were waiting for people to write it for you? How many tried to write their autobiography and realized no one would read it? <laughs> it really good. True? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, like, 
you know, from your youth on, there's not much to say. Most famous people, they don't talk a lot about their youth, right? Jesus is no exception here. And I like that because guess what? He didn't float around the world. He didn't have like, this year I'm going to India to, to reveal them to Buddha. And I'm not going over here. He didn't have all these mystical halos and floating and like, you know, all the miracles that people try to lay on him that are not in the Bible. He was a person. He was a baby. Guess what? He was a toddler. He never had terrible twos, I don't think, because he was perfect. But he grew up like that. And, you know, he lived those years. Uh, he was a child, right? He even went through, like, being a teenager. Imagine that. And he didn't sin. I mean, most of us, the greatest sins of our life are in sins of our youth. They would say all over and over again, God, forgive me from the sins of my, what? My youth. That's because that's when you're really dumb. Right? And you think you know everything, true? You know. You're young. You haven't lived enough to experience it. I think you can't get straight A's in school, but you don't have wisdom and applying and understanding to go with it. You're young and you think you're going to live forever. Well, a lot of people are very young because they thought they were going to live forever and had no fear and they should have fear. But they didn't. Because they were going to live forever. I thought I was going to live forever and die at 40. Maybe God will give me a seven more years than Jesus. Look at that. But past 40, you can keep it. Those people are old. I know. We're ancient. I know. Yeah. Yeah. We're ancient. But he lived that in the sins of his youth. Guess what? Most of my sins I can remember were sins of my youth. They were willful sins. That actually I lived through. I can't believe I did. I have friends that did live through those years. And so do a lot of you, whether it's car wreck, a drug overdose, whatever it may be, doing something stupid, finding out you wouldn't live forever. You're also in a rebellious age, aren't you, in, in, in teen years? Like you start to think literally in your mind, I've said this over and over again, something happens at the age of accountability around 12 or 13. Jesus is 12 here when we read this, and he begins to be a son of the law, but you begin to judge your parents years before that. It's like... Sure, mommy, I'll take out the trash. At 13, it's like, you have two hands. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? You're right there. You're going to make me get out of my chair? You're already standing up. You're halfway there. Yeah, yeah, you get it. We're rebellious at that age, aren't we? We know everything and we don't want anyone to tell us what to do, including our parents. Well, Jesus is going to live a perfect life. His brothers aren't going to like him. You know, this is mirrored in the life of Joseph. I mean, his brothers hated him so much, they threw him in a ditch. <laughs> Right? Took his clothes and poured blood on it, gave it to the father, said, I don't know what happened to him. We found this is all stuff. Is your robe of many colors you gave to him, but not us? He was your favorite? We chose him. And Joseph was like perfect, wasn't he? He was like the goody boy. You will all bow before me like the sun and the moon. <laughs> Should we kill him today? Even his parents want to get on him, right? Are you saying I'm with Jacob? Are you saying I'm going to bow down to you? Just tell me what I drank. I mean, he was like, you know, you want to kill a kid like that, especially when you're not that way, right? Shows you up all the time. Always good. Jesus was like Joseph, by the way. Joseph is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. He goes into slavery and death, and he comes out and he reigns over all of Egypt and saves his family. He's a type of Savior, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. A good one. An excellent spirit. Jesus was even better than that, and that's why his brothers really didn't want to believe in him. I understand that. You know, too much goodness can turn the stomach. But he lived 30 years of his life. So let's read this before I don't read the scriptures. 
So this is just a normal life. Remember, all the good drama is taken by Matthew before Luke gets it, right? The wise men, da 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 da, the wise men are coming. Then Herod's soldiers are coming after that. Da, 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 da. This is this an action. Matthew's got the action packed king story. That's already written. They've already read that. This is like the other story in between that. This is like, I can identify with this. I didn't have like Herod's soldiers chasing me when I was born. I didn't have wise men come to my house. Okay. But this is like more of the mundane narrative, not a lot of drama in here. So I like that. Because it's hard to relate to somebody who lived like that, and my life is like, no big shame. No big shame. My parents were so-and-so. I grew up in New Jersey. That's like Nazareth to you people I know. (laughs) Yeah. There he is. In verse 39, his life story from 1 to 30. So when they adjourned, but performed all things according to the law of the Lord. I want you to get that as we read that. The law of the Lord. What's the law of the Lord? The law of the Lord is all the commandments. They were very devout uh, that they kept all the laws. Well, they should be because this is been told to them. This is the Savior of the world, right? So they stayed like in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So they did everything that they should have done, the way they should have done it by the law. Then they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth, probably the worst city in all of Israel. Okay? For name, this is a place, you know, where he grew up, which is like the worst of the worst. This is like what you call the worst place in America, like LA, down by the homeless section. Uh, like a war torn, how about Ukraine, the Dumbas area? Like they just are going to kill in a few years, they're going to kill 2,000 people. The Roman army is probably camped here, walking through your town every day, Roman soldiers, the swords, right? Yeah, that's how you grew up. You're on the border in Ukraine with Russia. A war is going to happen. People are going to be crucified. Life's going to be hard. In fact, even the Jews think you're, that's good. That should happen there because you're a wretched city next to Samaria. Where else would it happen but there? You see, Satan puts this all on us. This is a viewpoint that we look at. It's a viewpoint God looks at. It's a viewpoint that Satan looks at. So, yeah, this is the worst place he goes to, Nazareth. But the child grew, and this is what the New Year's resolution for all of us is, that your soul would prosper like John would write in Second John. My soul would prosper. My whole life would prosper equally together. He was there, and you know what it says it did? The child did what? He grew and became strong in the spirit, was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is like a New Year's hope for all of us, isn't it? I mean, that's my hope. I, I feel like that coming out of surgery. I feel like God kept me alive. I have no idea why. That's what I told my cardiologist the other day he was half in the back when I saw him. I go, what can I do? He goes, you can do anything you want. I'm like, great, I'll tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, you're fine. Do anything you want. Can I go to the gym with the point? Yeah, do what you want. It's great. Yeah, yeah. And they, they asked me, they, I go, well, how do you feel? I go, I go, you know, I did a day for MC, better than to serve. I don't know why God kept me alive. But he's like, ah, that's great. He kept me alive. He just went on his way. No chance to witness. But I feel like God's given me a renewal of life. And if I have a renewal of life, I was in the gym yesterday, lifting weights again, which felt great. But I need to get stronger. True? Guess what? You need to get stronger. Body, soul, and spirit. You can't neglect any portion of it, right? If your body falls apart, there's not much good temple in your temple falling apart, right? Hard to worship in a falling down temple. So he became like that. He'll say this again at the end of this portion, by the way, just so you know. He'll close with this in verse 52. But the story goes on in verse 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year to the Feast of Passover. Now, this was a big feast, one of the big feasts. Not everybody could go to all the feasts. This was one that they went to. This is one that Jesus actually fulfills. Remember, if that analogy is correct. He may have been born on the new year, 
But the Day of Atonement isn't fulfilled for Israel. The Day of Sukkot isn't fulfilled for Israel. There's a feast, the Day of Pentecost isn't fulfilled, right? As far as God. Or the Day of Feast of Trumpets, excuse me, not the Day of Pentecost is fulfilled. The Feast of Trumpets is not. So there's a feast to fulfill. Here, he is going to fulfill in his life the Feast of Passover, which is deliverance for me and you from sin. But they went every year, which was for the Jew huge. It was costly. Imagine being poor, and you had to travel 80 miles, and you had to bring the money to stay, but money also to give, to buy a sacrifice. But they were devout. At 42, when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem. Now they'd gone 12 years in a row. They went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. Now this is a huge day. In the life of a boy, we call it bar mitzvah today. There was no bar mitzvah holiday at the time of Christ. It was added on later in Jewish history. But at 12 years of age, you were considered what the Bible calls a son of the law. Okay? That means when you spoke, you could talk to older people. You could debate the scriptures. To do that, you had to know the scriptures. Now, how many of you want to be a son of the law? That means you had to memorize books, like the whole Pentateuch, Leviticus, the names. Now, you can do that if you put down video games, TV, what you want to do for your pleasure. You can memorize a lot more than you think if you took the time to memorize what's important. Try that instead of, like, crossword puzzles. Throw your crossword puzzle away and memorize Bible verses. They'll be better for you. Instead of a word you'll never say in your life, but finally you found. That was marvelous, big crossword puzzles. Finding a word I'll never use, nor I've ever used. But now I know it, and now I forgot it. <laughs> I don't know, if it floats your boat, it helps you think, great. But can I give you something better, not that that's wrong? Why don't you try memorizing Bible verses? I can't memorize. Sure you can. I always say that. Can you give me the code to your debit card? Sure. But you won't. But you memorized it, right? Yeah. We can memorize if we put the time in to do it. And the main thing is, do we see our need to it? Do we repent? Repent. Okay. God wants to do that. Do I repent? Do I remember repent? And then do I act on that repentance and restore and reconcile to God, because I can think with God. Because God thinks, how oh, God thinks? Bible. His word is who he is. He esteems his word above his own name. Jesus, but what's his word say about Jesus? Do you know the verses about Jesus? Could you know more verses about Jesus? <coughs> yes, I can. Okay. That's called preaching conviction. It convicts me as much as it convicts you, okay? All right. So they went, they were devout, 12 years of age. He was a student of the law. He was at what we call the age of accountability. Why? Because they recognized by God that he was what? Someone who had brain power to make judgments, not just listen, but also to debate. He did that. He went up there. And when they had finished the days, they, they returned. And the boy, still a boy, Jesus lingered. Uh, behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it, okay? Now, this is a family caravan. This is the days, I think, when you could keep your doors open and not lock them. People kind of trusted people. They also, this is again like it is in the book of, uh, this book here, in the story of John the Baptist at the birth of Jesus and John. This is a family affair. In other words, the whole family's involved in this thing. So I can think, like, when they when they went here, you know, they supposed, he, you know, he was with the company, but he wasn't. They went a day's journey, okay? So they went a day's journey. That's like 20, maybe 20 miles, let's say. That's a good hike for a day, right? In a caravan of people. And then they went to camp down, and then they looked at, at all their sons, and then they, where's Jesus? That's a freak show for Mary. This is maybe the first time a sword began to pierce your heart. You'll know that if you ever lost a kid yeah. in a big place, right? Yeah. 
I still remember, and they remember my daughter as well, when we lost them in uh, Washington, D.C. at the, uh, the uh, Jim Memorial. Yeah. Oh, my God, there was tears and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't discipline them because they were already crying. <laughs> but they walked away while I was engaged with Lincoln's addresses, his speeches, which are all scripture. I just was in awe of what Lincoln said on those walls about God about the war, um, but they were lost. So they lost their kid. But now imagine this kid. This is the son of God. How would you feel if you lost the son of God? About your parent responsibilities. I mean, that would be a freak show, wouldn't it? What? What? Joseph, it was your responsibility. Where is he? I don't know, Mary. I thought he was with. No. Now, this was a caravan, and you read this on. They're freaked out as you get through the, the lines of this. They didn't know it. But supposing they have been with what? The company. They went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So they were with these people looking for their relatives because what would happen? Well, you know, he's with Aunt Salome. Uh, he went with Elizabeth and Zacharias to hang out, you know, with John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist was like a little older than him, right? So they went and arm wrestled and rolled around in love, of course. Uh, but he was hanging out with his family. And so you wouldn't think much if he was with your sister or your aunt or whatever. They all went up. I'm sure John the Baptist's parents were there, don't you think? They were devout. This is only 12 years. I'm sure John and James's mother was there, which is the sister of Mary. She was there. I'm sure there were other people there that aren't mentioned in the Bible. James and John were there, and then James and uh, his brother Judas were hanging out. Judah was there somewhere, right? So what am I trying to say? In a real life, there's a real family, isn't there? Now, we got religions that would take the life of Jesus and say he had no family, except Mary and Joseph. Do you get that? That's not real to me. That's only child syndrome, and only child syndrome isn't good. I'm not saying more about that. It ain't good. It's better to have kids that you can discipline. It's better to have extras that you can threaten. <laughs> One gets out of line, we have a lot of extras. We don't really need you. In fact, we'd be more wealthy without you. And now it would be more peaceful. You use whatever you can use, right? To get results when it's all right. Yeah. So, yeah, he wasn't an only child. It's family. That I can relate to family. Good, bad, and ugly. All of us, true. But I can relate to that. And I can relate to him thinking that, hey, they were there. So they went out there. And then they came back to their relatives. And they looked for everybody. And so they did not find him. They returned to Jerusalem. So this is one day out. He's so accurate. This one day journey out. Well, it's one day journey out. It's one day journey what? Back, isn't it? Okay. And now, so in verse 46, they were seeking him. Verse 46, now it was after three days. On the third days, they're looking around. They're going crazy looking around Jerusalem for him. And they found him in the temple. Sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking questions. Cool, huh? I mean, he is working out, and they're like, they're like, the response is like, all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So that when they saw him, they were what? Amazed. And his mother and father were watching this process, I'm sure, and then she butts in and says to him, Okay, she's just totally ripped, I'm sure. If I know a mother, she's like a bear. You remember this too. This kid has never disobeyed his mother. True? And she thinks this is total disobedience. So I guess the shock of the first time the Emmanuel, the song of the angels, disobeys would really Okay, what is going on here? You, she's about tempted to say, hey, my God, I don't know what would have happened if she said it. You are a 
bad. <laughs> I've heard that through all my siblings, but never me. You are blessed. Maybe the universe would have ended right there. <laughs> Jesus couldn't take that. Right? But he lived this now. And, you know, they were amazed. And then he looks at her, and, and what she says is, son, why have you done this to us? You hurt us. You sinned. Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. In other words, we are totally vexed, freaked out to the 100%. Exhausted. We just ran. It's a bad enough an 80-mile journey. We just did 25 out, and we just did 25 back. And now we're going to do 80 miles. All the way back to 80 miles. You know, three days back to South Nazareth with you. And what's his answer? And it's the only red letter we have of these 30 years. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Now what's this huge for? This is the only speaking and this is the only testimony that we have of this youth. Some people think that there's doctrines that teach that Jesus became God at the baptism of John the Baptist, that he was just a common man. This scripture stands in the face of all heresy that he knew he was God. He says to them, I'm about my father. Better translation, would you not found me in my father's house? Now, business could give a bunch of things. He could have been scoping out the land for Joseph to do some carpentry work, right? I don't think so. I think my father and me could make that better, that one better remodel the priest rooms here. No, he wasn't doing that. He was in the Word, wasn't he? And he was asking them questions. Remember, he used this dialogue. That's why question and answer are huge teaching things. That's what we teach. We want to ask questions because he's asking them questions. Not to necessarily show him how amazing or say that he's God, but he wants to know what they think about the Messiah. He wants to know what they think about scriptures. When he gets to his ministry life, he'll be way more teaching. Here he wants to be taught too. He wants them to say, what do you think about this? Teach me. When he takes his role as Jesus full grown in his ministry, he is teaching them. He might ask a question, but he asks a question to teach them. Here's he's asking a question for them to teach him, to teach them their perception on the law and the Messiah. Do you get that? But he's also answering. And he's also amazing these people, these teachers of the law, with the wisdom he has for a 12-year-old boy. Kind of cool, huh? But he's doing another thing here, which is greater. He's saying that I'm about my father's business. Now, this isn't an angel saying it. This isn't Zachariah saying, you're the most high. This is Jesus himself for the first time saying, I am the son of God. Do you get that? At 12 years old, he knows he's the son of God. He's not in doubt at the baptism. He's not in doubt from here on and in any part of his life. He is openly knowing it, not that he didn't know it before, but he's openly confessing it. I'm about my father's house. Like, you know what? I'm subject to you, and he'll go on here to be subject to them. But he goes, my real purpose is to be about my father's house or his business. True? And that's a huge statement. And that makes him... A child and the son of the law, but greater than the son of the law, he's the son of God. And that's huge. That's huge. At 12 years old, he was the son of the law by men. But by God, he was what? He was the lawgiver. He was the fulfillment of the law, wasn't he? Yeah, we go on, he's under his parents. In the next verses. But he has no beginning and end. And yet he put himself under his parents. 
Imagine this guy. You young people have a hard time being under your parents. He had no parents. He had to listen to him. He had to refer to him. Imagine the holy restraint he had not to wipe out everyone with the nonsense they were given. And he had the power and the right to do it at any time. He puts himself under the authority of the scribes and Pharisees, under the Romans. He who has all authority in heaven and earth. Imagine the restraint. See, conviction isn't just about motivation to do something. It's about the restraint not to do something. Hello? The restraint not to do something. That's why, you know, I was given by a great definition on meekness and humility to the Spirit the other day. I've been studying this for years, but meekness is really about humility and meekness together, the same size of the coin, like grace and mercy. I have to be humble before I'm meek, because I have no power. Meekness is one of the definitions which never got me uh, earnest expectation, hope, but meekness was always power under control. Well, I don't have I do what God gives it to me. How do I get power from God? Well, power from God would be the favor of God. How do I get the favor of God? Well, I humble myself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift me up. Power. Now I'm up. What's meekness? Power to lift men up. You get the two working together? Love God and love your neighbor also. Well, how do you go down and lift up somebody, like between bridges is a great example, like that has a, a leg that's ready to fall off. It's all kinds of, you know, filter, sin. How do I lift them up unless I have been humble to God and I have the power to lift them up? How do I have the power to lift up people I don't really care about in the natural? Listen, we all in natural. Gee, but didn't we just preach about Jesus being coming to the temple to be circumcised. And the only people that show up were two ancient people that nobody really thought anything about. They're 100 years old. Ellie's in the back room coming like Anna. Right? There's a baby here. That's God. Is she going to have an aneurysm on the floor? She's 100 and something years old. How many people really look at her for much input in life? But she's written in the Bible, isn't she? Yeah, Simeon the same. You don't see the famers there. You don't see the high priest there. Do you? you don't see those people there. No, not at all. See, it's just a little common story, isn't it? Which for my common life is huge. In humility, God lifts me up to be a son of God greater than just the son of the law. That I might have the ability to want to lift people up. Huge. I keep my mouth shut, but keep my mouth open. Defend it, restraint, right? To not say what I'm thinking. And love to say what I need to say. That's a good definition. I like it. It's good. You can tear it apart, do whatever, but I like it, so I'm keeping it. Uh, chapter 2 continues here in the book of Luke. And we look at the idea after this. They were amazed. And then he about his father's business. But the last verses are 51 and 52. And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth again. The worst place in all, in all that whole area he's living. And he was what? Subject to them. In other words, he put himself under his parents, didn't he? And his mother kept all these things in her heart. Yeah. For 30 years, he lived with them. And here it is again, Jesus increased. This is a great New Year's one. A great New Year's remembrance that God wants me to increase in wisdom and stature and with favor with God and men. He asked God and men, here there's your weakness, right? Before I have favor with men in the right way, I need favor with God. I have humility towards God, but then I can have weakness towards you. And say what I should say. And keep silent for what I should keep silent, right? True? Restraint. I need restraint. I'm a loaded cannon, is my name. 
I need restraint. But I also need motivation too, right? I need all of that. I guess we'll close with looking at Philippians chapter 2 because we have a few minutes here left. But I think it explains it best. Remember what I said? The, the Gospels give you the narrative, but the epistles do what? What do the epistles do? They explain it, don't they? And nothing explains it better than Philippians chapter 2 as a commentary. I like Bible commentaries that are already here. So what do I do with this? Let this mind, verse 5, Philippians chapter 2. Read it with me if you can. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. There is the God-man but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, he put himself under all these things. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself because he was in the appearance of a man for us and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not in my presence only but now much more in my absence Work out your own salvation, paradox, with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you might be blameless and harmless children or sons of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights to the world holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ and uh, not have run in vain or labored in vain. I guess that's a prayer of the pastor at 16 that I have not labored in vain, but this is a prayer for you to have the mind of Christ if you humble. See, I can only do something if somebody's done it before me who asked me to do it. That's when it really logically clicks from here in my mind to my heart, to my feet. That the person asking me has done it. That's why it's so important to walk out your faith and live it. That's why it's so important not to try to lean on vain resolutions that the world has. I'm going to be better this year, but I've said that for how many years of my life? <laughs> and I'm still falling. No, I, I think this year I'd like to be picked up by God. I think I'd like to maybe remember that I have a great help. I can't help myself. I don't know who I am, why I'm here, where I'm going. But I have a great help of a person that knows all those things and can give me the strength to find them out and live them. And I think I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to try to make a, can you have a conviction to remember? Be convicted. But you know what conviction means? See, you either can live in responsibility or guilt. I faced that last night calling somebody who can't go to church anymore and I'm, I'm like, am I doing this because of guilt or responsibility? Or am I doing it to get them to come to church? Or am I doing it because I love them? And that's between them and God. So I set my mind on doing it, I'm going to do it because I love them. And I know it's hard for them to get out, and I know that. And I'm going to do it because I love them. And it's going to build them up and lift them up. Because that's what I'm called to do. God does the rest. And I set my mind like that, and I was, it was such a great thing. It was responsibility, and there was no guilt in it. I don't want to be motivated by guilt. God doesn't want you motivated by guilt. You want you to be motivated by love. And love is always responsible. And love does what it can do. It can't bear everybody's burdens, but the burdens God puts in front of me, I should bear. 
God will make them known to be those burdens, right? You can't be a hundred places at one time, but you can be somewhere at one time, right? And be responsible to those things. I'd like to see our New Year's resolution for the church and for each other to grow in grace and knowledge of these things, right? To grow strong in every area we can improve, but also like make him known and have favor with God. Isn't that good? Yeah, you guys can come up with sing the last song, but we'll try to worship at the end of the service. And look what I did, Mel. It's 20 after, right? So listen, in the back, I didn't say this. If you have a testimony, you know, I know some of you do. Jonathan probably has one. He always has a testimony. But we're going to have the mic open. I've got a testimony. If you have a testimony of the goodness of God this year and a hope for the future for the next year, the mic's going to be open. I want you to come up. I don't want you to take that. Boy, we have a lot of desserts and uh, hors d'oeuvres in the back, so you won't be hungry. Okay? Well, that's fellowship. That's called communion, by the way, right? True. With him and each other. Amen. Father, bless us. Bless the food. And Lord, I thank you we can end with worship to start a new year. In Jesus' name, amen.